welcome to this uh, latest event in the Danube Institute series of talks on geopolitics and other matters. Uh, tonight, we have the pleasure of um, Dr. Brittany Pfeiffer Noble, who taught last week on uh, Russian Orthodoxy. Um, this week, she's talking on um, Eurasianism as a response to global crisis. Uh, looking at the way in which um, Alexander Dugin, the controversial Russian philosopher, uh, the role he plays in the relation to the long century of Russian Eurasianism. And um, uh, in response and alongside uh, Brittany's talk, we have um, Anton Benajewski from Economist Foundation, who's... Uh, going to fill in some of the gaps that might appear in the Eurasianist discourse. So over to you, Brittany, and uh, we'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, David. Thank you to everyone from the Danube for having me here. Um, I'll, okay. So, let me start. What is Vladimir Putin thinking? What is he reading? Who are his confidants? The West has been fascinated with the inner life of Putin since his rapid ascendancy to the highest position of power in the Russian Federation over 20 years ago. Fiercely private, shrouded in a specter of his KGB career and his oligarch comrades, Putin's persona takes on mythic qualities as a despotic czar. And of course, the shocking and outrageous invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022 has made the West even more frantic to make sense of the mechanisms of his decision making. Moreover, the sharp increase in censorship in the Russian media and in their social media since the outbreak of the war encourages and escalates the mystique around Putin's motivations and influences. Are they geopolitical? Are they religious? Is it nihilism? Is it all of the above? One rather colorful theory that has gained traction in popular media and even some recent scholarship places singular importance on the thought of political philosopher and activist Alexander Dugin within the Russian political landscape. In the English-speaking world, Dugin was dubbed Putin's brain in a 2014 foreign affairs article covering the Russian invasion of Crimea. This title stuck, no surprise, and appears throughout the English coverage of Dugin and his philosophies, not least of all in a recent monograph with this very title. And when we look at this recent interest in Dugan, who has become an iconic figure, who, who has been an iconic figure among the fringe far-right circles for decades, and we examine any potential role of his in informing Putin's foreign policy, we need to take into account a long tradition of Russian Eurasianism and the place that this theory holds in the context of political dissent, philosophical experimentation, and the massive and recent shift in the geopolitical balance. Is Dugan a warmongering fascist crank is he a savvy self-promoter? Is he a serious philosopher? In my lecture today, I hope to provide you with an analysis of his thought with the goal of situating him in a handful of key contexts that are necessary for understanding him as an heir to the historical or what I'll call classical Eurasianism as a performative dissident and an esoteric prophet of a postmodernist and anti-Western counterculture. And finally, as an ideological export product. So I'll start by speaking a little bit about historical Eurasianism. So Dugan's ideas and ideology have shifted over many years in the public arena, but one idea that he has never moved away from is allegiance to the idea of what he calls neo-Eurasianism. And I want to just, just discuss what historical Eurasianism is, is to locate what that means for Dugan. Eurasianism began in the 1920s as a product of white Russian emigres who published abroad several series of polemical essays espousing a new identity and path forward for Russia based on the principles of what they called Eurasia. So the Eurasianists approached history, culture, religion, and politics from the conviction that Eurasia, the territory from Western Russia through the steppe, Mongolia, Siberia, and reaching into the Far East and the Iranian plateau was an organic geographical and cultural unit and they used an array of linguistic, anthropological, and geological categories to defend the physical and cultural unity of Eurasia, and in turn argued for the creation of a political entity that would reflect this unity. And it was a new twist to a very old conversation about whether Russia was a part of Europe, was it a part of Asia, was it West, East or West, and the Eurasians offered what they believed was a third way in this longstanding debate. 
Eurasianism was one of the earliest and most organized intellectual responses by the Russian diaspora to the question of post-revolutionary -re Russian identity. And I want to emphasize Eurasianism as a movement and not a philosophy, because it was really defined by a constellation of individuals who gathered around the idea and then gave it philosophical, religious, scientific, and cultural flesh. The four, main ding, the four main founding figures each had their own scholarly fields of expertise. George Flaurovsky was a theologian and a church historian. Savitsky was an economist. Prince Trubatskoy was a, a linguist. And uh, Peter Subchinsky was a musical critic. So Trubatskoy was the sort of leader of the group, which started in Sofia, but then they would disperse throughout Europe uh, over the course of the 20s. Famous figures, I mean, somewhat famous figures in this world, such as Roman Jakobson and the historian George Vernatsky would also be associated with the first and second generations of Eurasian thinking. So deploying a blend of polemical rhetoric, scientific hypothesizing, and historiographic imagination, the Eurasianists believed that there were certain laws that governed historical processes, and they proposed that the lessons of Western history couldn't fully account for the Russian Revolution, nor could they guide Russians in their current predicament. They hoped that Eurasianism would be able to safeguard against nationalism and what they saw as a splintering and dehumanizing tendency at home and abroad. Eurasianism would bring together different peoples into a socio-political or cultural harmony, but without demanding that they lose their unique features. And in this sense, we can see how their ideas also reflected the Russian imperial notion of Russia as a multi-ethnic space, an idea that would also become a cornerstone of the Soviet multi-ethnic union of peoples. However, for the Eurasianists, a crucial component of these identity building narratives was the search for laws or principles that explain or predict cultural development using the language of growth and decay. And here, Oswald Spengler was very important and his ideas of cultural morphology and civilizational epochs were a major influence on the Eurasianists. In particular, his biological model of cultures that favored a type of organicism and sees decline as something that can be natural, but can also be the result of inappropriate cultural appropriation. Spengler sees cultures as the expression of a national soul, and the elements of a given culture exist in what he calls a morphological relationship to organic history. The soul of a culture then functions a little bit like a very simplified version of our modern genetics. It allows for some historical expression, excuse me, historical influence on the expression of a culture, like a plant would respond to its environment, but it also assumes that there are real morphological limitations to any given culture. Culture is neither predetermined, but it is shaped by the interplay of its internal essence and the concrete realities of culture and the, of, of the interaction with other cultures and of history. The notion of a society or national culture having an organic essence is found in a variety of Russian intellectual movements, and it's a centerpiece of classical Eurasianism and Dugan's neo-Eurasianism. So inseparable from this idea of organicism, then, is a tendency to reject any universal social or political model. Meaning, if the mode of being of a uh, the the mode of being of a particular people is a reflection of a distinct organism, so their expression must be distinct as well, which allows for a certain degree of cultural relativism, both vis-a-vis -vis the West and Russia's non-Western neighbors. So in classical Eurasianism, this insistence on organic national or social characteristics were held up by scientific and quasi-scientific arguments to explain the integrity of Eurasia as a geographical and civilizational unit. So Savitsky, who was an economist by training, explained that the demarcations of Eurasia were based on geographical features. It was a land ocean, and it was encompassing four distinct climates, the tundra, the forest, the steppe, and the desert. And this formed the basis for distinctive but compatible cultural temperaments within this land mass. So the expansiveness then for him of Eurasia is also what informs its political needs, namely autocracy, hierarchy, and a profound aversion to democracy. Um, this school of thinking about Eurasianism has been deemed by one scholar, Martin Weiswanger, to be a secular political camp of scientific Eurasianists. On the other side, we have a kind of metaphysical religious movement that have been called the utopian Eurasianists. So these Eurasianists emphasized the importance of the Orthodox Church and of faith for Russian or Eurasian identity and posited that there was a particularly Eurasian mode of being that was either anti-rational or trans-rational, inclined towards the mystical, the intuitive, the creative, and they were more tolerant of material tradition and the physical world in contrast to a Western tendency towards disembodiment and abstraction. So what these two camps, these utopians and these scientists, have in common is that they 
have, they have parallel conceptions of the importance of unity and integrity. These values that we can see traced throughout um, the early philosophical debates in Russia and which remain core values in Dugan's philosophy of Eurasianism and in the fourth political theory. So the story of how classical Eurasianism largely faded from the intellectual and political, political landscape is too long of a story for today's lecture, but in brief, it hinged on a very vicious split over whether or not to compromise with Soviet authorities. Some founding members abandoned the movement altogether, World War II broke out, people emigrated, and the project largely fell apart. <clears throat> there was a resurgence, though, of Eurasianism in post-war Soviet Union thanks to the work of Lem Lev Gumilov, so the, the son of the... Uh, famous uh, poet Anna Akhmatova and almost as famous poet uh, Nikolai Gumilov was his father. Um, so he was a deeply eccentric but very influential figure whose Eurasianism was considered valuable for creating a shared identity and ideology for Slavs and Central Asians in the Soviet space and beyond. He was a strong supporter of all national movements, Turkic, Mongolian, and East Asian, and wanted people to be able to cultivate their ethnic identity and political agency. And he believed that these groups, once empowered, would in turn create in a great pan-Turkic or pan-Turanian, which is including the Iran, confederation of peoples and states that included Russians within a framework of a multi-ethnic Soviet empire. So Gumilov was hardly just the geographer with a penchant for pan-Turkism or nationalism. And his philosophical materialism was a very far cry from orthodox Soviet Marxism. His ideas are infused with esoteric and cosmic elements, most famous of which is his, co his concept of passionarity. I have it here, I left it in the Russian, which it, so this passionarnost, passionarity, which is this idea that people, distinct ethnic groups or peoples have a collective capacity for suffering, which is exemplified in the combination of a sort of martial spirit, a willingness to fight, and a solidarity with each other. And this level of passionarity or passionarness influences a people's ability to defend themselves from invaders and influences their ability to expand their own borders. Gumilov was, though, in brief, was kind of a, a one-man show, and after him, Uri, Eurasianism largely dis disappeared from public discourse until the emergence of Alexander Dugin as a public figure in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now, just how influential Dugin is, is much of a debate, and but there is no debating that he is highly visible um, within the Russian political landscape since the collapse of the Soviet Union. He's not only involved in political activism, but also countercultural artistic movements, youth movements, institutional and informal teaching of philosophy, and he was an early visionary when it came to understanding the potential of the internet for the diffusion of ideology. Not least, his incessant calls for violently uniting the territories of Holy Rus sadly sound almost prophetic in the light of the current war but I'm getting ahead of myself. In 1993, Dugin founded the National Bolshevik Party with the writer and dissident Edward Lemonov. Their party aimed to bring together the far left with the far right and exceeded, if nothing else, in attracting copious media attention for the two followers. They made a very unlikely couple. Lemonov was known for his highly graphic, lightly fictionalized memoirs of a debauched life in Russia and in exile, drug abuse, homosexual sex, casual violence. He was nihilism embodied if you could reconcile political activism with performative self-destruction. He was countercultural, opposed to traditions and morals, and saw himself as the vanguard of a new Russian far left that hated Yeltsin as much as it hated the prospect of an emergent post-Soviet bourgeoisie. After he split, so if uh, I'll show you here, this is the emblem of the National Bolshevik Party, which Dugin left in 1998, uh, and they moved further west than, or what, the party moved further left without Dugan. It later would have this symbol of a grenade, which is also a pun on Lemono's name. And here is famous footage of him personally firing a machine gun at Sarajevo during the Yugoslav War. It, it maybe, it, so he said. So by contrast, Dugan, from the very beginning of the project, projected an image of self-control traditional, markedly Slavic masculinity. Despite a far-right uh, far posture that mirrored Lomonov's purported leftism, Dugin's conservatism left ample room for kindling nostalgia for elements of the Soviet and even the Stalinist state. And both men hoped that national Bolshevism would be a third way beyond fascism and beyond communism. The party was highly critical of centrist majority political institutions such as the courts and the police 
and was vocally and dramatically critical of Putin when he came to power in 2000 as part of Yeltsin's unity party. Dugin and Lomonov, as I mentioned, would split in 1998, and Dugin left the National Bolsheviks for good, but these experimental years of heading a highly mediatized, far-left, far-right, ultra-nationalist project was a great opportunity for him to make connections with other similarly inclined groups in Europe and with Moscow counterculture movements. Both men were very involved in a vibrant underground out scene, and in a way, just because the Soviet system was over it didn't mean that they couldn't still have fun being dissidents. Their extremism, their political activism gave them social capital also in Moscow in a world of artists, writers, performers, and musicians who were resisting the top-down attempts of the state to create order, stability, and a Western-style status quo. And their reactionary bohemianism had a certain appeal, even a spectacle, for at least some of the post-Soviet citizens who were struggling to fit into a new state, a new society, and economy. The aesthetics of the National Bolsheviks was infused with punk iconography, coupled with regular calls for violence and military action. And the party was shut down um, for inciting uh, racial hatred uh, by the government and had, to, and had to be restarted later. So after Dugan left the party, though, he began to establish himself now as a real kind of political theorist, um, starting with his 1998 uh, publication, Geopolitics. So now he starts kind of laying out how the post-Soviet geopolitical balance of powers came to exist and how Russia could have an exceptional role. His platform, then as it remains now, can be summed up as a rejection of American, or what he calls Atlantic, hegemony in favor of a multipolar geopolitics that rejects liberalism. So in 2002, he founded the Eurasian Party, and he would publish and widely lecture on his version of Eurasianism, neo-Eurasianism, and then in 2005 also find the Eurasian Youth Movement, which still exists as a sort of fringe, far-right group, I think largely on the internet. So I'll let Dugan explain his Eurasianism in his own words. The more specific and narrow meaning of the term Eurasianism pertains to what is traditionally called the Old World. The notion of the old world is a multi-civilizational superspace inhabited by nations, states, cultures, ethnicities, and religions that are connected to each other historically and geographically by dialectic destiny. The old world is an organic product of human history. Here we can see some resonances with historical Eurasianism. He continues, it is impossible to separate history from spatial conditions, and the analysis of civilizations must proceed not only along the temporal axis, but also along the spatial axis. So here we again see him sort of setting up Eurasianism as having this cultural particularisms and relativisms. My last. No single state or region has the right to claim to be the standard for all the rest. Every people has its own pattern of development, its own ages, its own rationality, and deserves to be understood and evaluated according to its own internal criteria. <clears throat> However, he just, wait, let me, so, no, sorry. He then goes on to say that Eurasianism in this context needs to be defined as a project for the strategic, geopolitical, and economic integration of the northern region of the Eurasian continent, the cradle of European history, and the matrix of European peoples. So in his early Eurasianism, he's really willing to extend what was the historical Eurasianism into the full, the whole European landmass, that it's going to be a big tent that the French, that the Germans could join. They together can still remain opposed to an Anglo-American Atlanticism. Along with, he says, along with Turkey, Russia, just as the ancestor, oh, not here, sorry, it's not on the slide. Um, Along, just as the ancestors of many Europeans, is historically connected to the Turkic, Mongolia, and Caucasian peoples. Russia offers the integration of Europe with a Eurasian dimension that is symbolic and geographical in terms of identification with Eurasianness and continentalism. And this continentalism, which we saw from Savitsky's landmass, um, is now Dugan is not so concerned about the sort of geographical limitations of the landmass, but a kind of Mackinder idea update that great land civilizations are going to be contrasted with maritime powers. And for Dugan, this is a real political threat. He feels that Eurasia is, is under real threat from American imperialism, from uh, activity in North Africa and in the Middle East, and then of course from the encroachment of NATO. Dugan's kind of multipolar world though starts to shift uh, in the late 2000s, in the 2010s, where this there's a real hierarchy of what was is organic and then what is artificial. So he opposes the old world and the new world. And 
says that the Americans transformed the New World. So they had kind of been Europeans, but they created an artificial civilization where European product projects of modernism reached their fulfillment. It was constructed on man-made ideology, a civilization as purified modernism. And here we really begin to see a shift away from classical Eurasianisms. For the Eurasianists, it was artificial for Russia to attempt to be European because the Russian character and nation were not suited for Western culture and political structures. But theirs was a type of multipolar project, not that they use that word, that rejected that there was one mode of culture or political organization. Now, critics of this movement have pointed out that in a multipolar world, it's slightly incompatible with orthodoxy, which insists on universal truths. But I won't, I won't dwell on how classical Eurasians deal with this, but I will mention that for Dugan, he's very open to a sort of religious spiritual syncretism that is an essential part of his Eurasianism and his theory of the fourth political theory. So, He really, so here, I just want to, I, we don't have to read this entire thing, but Eurasianism now becomes a project of anti-imperialism and anti-modernists. And it is a way of saying no to progress. Um, he believes that Eurasianism has a cyclical, non-progressive way of development. And the opposite of this is the purely individualist, superficial liberty um, of the West. Instead, what he wants is social responsibility and a spiritual inner freedom. Um, What's interesting here is that in the, in, the, the, in the first landmark Eurasian volume, Exodus to the East, the Eurasianists wrote together, any inclination towards Eurasianism is an inclination towards modernity. And conversely, any decline in modernity is a decline in Eurasianism. For them, when they were doing their project, it was avant-garde to have a structuralist framework to be scientific and religious to have this third way. And we can see already now that Dugan needs to move beyond this um, sort of Hegelian synthesis of East-West Eurasian to have something more powerful once he has captured uh, modernity in his gaze. For him, modernity and the expression of the West increasingly becomes a universal and almost satanic force. And he's also reflecting a spirit of apocalypticism that you can see in a lot of other writers in the 1990s. But it's being performed, and, and there was, and of course, Eurasianism, historical Eurasianism, also grew out of a certain apocalypticism, which you can see in a lot of, of post Bolshevik thinkers. But now it's happening in a completely different system of values, a completely different system of, uh, of aesthetics. I mean, if we think that the, the, the leader of the first Eurasians is this dignified, educated, an actual prince, Trubetskoy, and we compare him with Limonov, who's firing off machine guns and setting off smoke bombs and writing about his sexual escapades. We've, we've come a long way. <laughs> um, and on that, we can sense in Dugin, vis-a-vis -vis the old Eurasianist, vis-a-vis -vis as well, Limonov, this profound, vis-a-vis -vis certainly the, the Russian state at the time, a profound frustration and anger at the failure of the state, the Russian state, to safeguard the nation from unfitting outside influences. And just to kind of, for his part of his um, brand, this is him. Uh, so what him and Limonov always had in common was this inc these inc incitements to violence, basically, and very well staged publicity stunts. Um, I don't know if he really fired that, but he posed for it. He was ready to, to invade the contested territories of Ossetia um, before the 2008 Russian-Georgian War. Um, so I, I bring this up also because his kind of posturing can also be seen as um, an, another extension of very highly esoteric and even mystical notions of what should be happening in the political space. His role is now a philosopher and the links uh, and, and just kind of problematizing how, how seriously we take him as, as a politician with real aspirations. So he, in 2009, he publishes the fourth political theory and he basically sees the 20th century as having had three main political movements. First, it was liberalism. And then there was fascism, which was uh, conquered with World War II. And then there was communism as a response to liberalism. And then this failed after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So liberalism then, as the dominant political party or dominant political model, morphs into something beyond politics. And it becomes the status quo. It becomes invisible because it's absolutely everywhere. Everyone was liberal. Now everyone lives post-liberal and what he calls 
individuals defined by consumption and liberated from identity based on nation, language, religion, or biology. This causes the phenomenon of globalization, a model of post-industrial society that makes itself known, and the postmodern era has begun. The individual subject is no longer the result of a choice, but it's a mandatory given. Man is free from his membership in all collective identities, and the ideology of human rights becomes widely accepted and is practically compulsory. So I want to highlight that now he's also moving. He's post-liberal, but he's post-modern. And post-modernity is incredibly important to Dugan. So on the one hand, you could see this end of history as a sort of Fukuyama-esque political idea. On the other hand, he believes really in a, or he really relies on postmodern literary critics to talk about how there is no center, no tradition, there is no grand narrative of human culture, um, there is nothing limiting, and so we are at this, we're, we're in a postmodern situation of constant consumption, constant uh, throwing away of values, it's a sort of totalitarian chaos, um, and he says, so now we have, sorry, I'm going to move, um, there is no way to engage in politics because there is no alternative to liberalism. But wait, we must strain the imagination and seize the reality of the new global world and correctly decipher the challenges of postmodernity and create something new, something beyond the political battles of the 19th and 20th centuries. Such an approach is an invitation to the development of the fourth political theory beyond communism, fascism, and liberalism. The fourth political theory reads like a manifesto, a philosophical treatise, and an occultic description of the cosmos. In short, it is not your standard geopolitical text. Dugan repeats, sometimes ad nauseum, well-worn tro well tropes about the evil and hegemonic West, about the perniciousness of liberalism, about the need for a reordering of society, and his canon of thinkers includes Carl Schmitt, Baudrillard, and Martin Heidegger, and he does not hesitate at all to jump into the deep end of a cosmic reordering of reality to decipher the paradigm of postmodernity. Because of this, Dugan's prose can sometimes read like 1980s deconstructionism having been run through Jack chat GPT. For example, in the fourth political theory, he gives an extended meditation on the meaning of gender. I won't read the whole quote to you, but to get a taste for how he self-consciously pastiches postmodern academic prose, I will read two sentences. Going beyond the limits of a gender which we know, we get to the domain of uncertainty, androgyny, the sex of angels. In the same sphere, it is necessary to search for a gender of the fourth political theory, namely the sphere of as as much as absolute risk behind a limit of the collapsed chimera of the modern, we outline only lines. We know that it is gender of Dasein, traject, a gender representing a root reality. It belongs to l'imaginaire. By extending a chain of reflections, we raise the question about a gender of the radical self, which goes beyond all basic paradigms. There's not much point and me trying to analyze this text or parse his many references. But I want to bring it up as a lead into the next part of my talk, which is to discuss seriously whether we can consider Dugan to have a tangible influence on the geopolitical thinking in the Kremlin and in contemporary Russia. So Dugin certainly has had official involvement in Russian politics. He was the head of the National Bolsheviks, which predates Putin's regime. And despite being initially very critical of Putin from a National Bolshevik standpoint, over the past 15 years, Dugin has been an outspoken defender of Putinism, sometimes critical because he's more Putinist than Putin. And of course, influence, but of course, supporting a politician is a long shot from actually influencing one. And the English language media loves to hate Dugan, and it's understandable so. He's photogenic, his name is easy enough for news commentators to pronounce, and he's happy to play the role of a menacing, mystical Russian madman titillating the Western imagination. But while there's been much ink spilled about Dugan as a sort of Rasputin who can manipulate things behind the scenes, an idea that he himself embraces and promotes, there's never been any known direct ties between Putin and Dugan, and nor had Putin ever mentioned or cited Dugan publicly until this past August when he denounced the assassination of Dugan's daughter, Daria. However, we do have two occasions where Putin has publicly mentioned a different Eurasianist thinker who I brought up, Lev Gumilov. This Soviet thinker's notion of passionarity made an appearance in a national address by Putin in 2013. Who will take the lead and who will remain on the periphery and inevitably lose their independence will depend not only on the economic potential, but primarily on the will of each nation, on its inner energy, which Lev Gumilov termed passionarity, uh, or passionarity, sorry, the ability to move forward and embrace change, which is a 
gentle description. Move forward and embrace change. And in an interview, uh, he was asked in 2021 if he still believed in passionarity. And he said, yes, I believe in passionarity and I believe in the theory of passionarity. So if Dugan's writings are esoteric, circular, and reflective of an obtuse continental philosophies, his political position, in sharp contrast, is straightforwardly crude and brutal. Unlike Gumilov's idea of a passionarity that can fortify nations in their struggle to exist and develop, Dugan's idea ideology is explicitly violent, and his, precisely his calls for violence that have transformed his reception in Russia and abroad. Dugan has long supported the idea of Eastern Ukraine becoming a part of the Russian Federation. And in fact, he was fired from his position at the Center for Conservative Studies in the, at the Sociology Faculty of Moscow State University in 2014 because of his incitement to kill Ukrainians. He was a vocal su supporter of not only annexation of Crimea, but a full-scale attack on Ukraine to recreate kind of holy Rus, and he has never changed this position. So like many on the far left and the far right, Dugan justifies his calls for violence by using examples of American or NATO violence. In an interview from earlier this year, he claims that Russia is only fighting the war halfway, and he likens this situation to disastrous for Russia that it will be like an outcome of the Crimean War or the Russo-Japanese War of the early 20th century. But while such exaggerated enthusiasm for war was absolutely toxic in Moscow a decade ago, now he's saying out loud what some people would like the public to be thinking or saying things that some people might want to be officially acceptable. But Dugan is not the one to blame for Russia having got to where it is now. Taking Dugan seriously as a political figure or thinker is a Western response to a global crisis. Launching a full-scale land war in 21st century Europe must be the act of a madman, or maybe a, mad, or maybe a man reading a madman, or maybe a man reading a man who likes to act like a madman. And this is all good marketing for Dugan after a fashion. But I think it's wrong to see him as Putin's brain or to attempt to locate his significance within the Kremlin walls. To take him seriously as a philosopher, as a recent essay in the American Christian journal First Things does, is a mistake. There are far more clear-headed thinkers to turn to if you want a critique of liberalism or a geopolitical analysis. Likewise, Western detractors of his thought have equally missed the point out of him. He sees himself as a prophet and a performer. He's not worried about minor details like intellectual inconsistencies or being embarrassed that there's Western influences on his anti-Westernism. And I think it's precisely as a performer, perhaps, no, that we can take him seriously. Like any good performer, he can play multiple roles. In Middle Eastern media, like the pro Hezbollah Lebanese satellite network, Amayadeen, he makes regular appearances, giving interviews in English, presenting himself as a culturally conservative Noam Chomsky. And he exoriates America for its injustices and emphasizes the compatibility between traditional Russian and Islamic cultural mores. In the West, where in a sense he continues a Soviet strategy of cultivating sympathy with those on the political fringe, he's a work of art. He's a living meme, self-constructed to offend and excite. Online, denizens of 4chan and anime-obsessed self-described Nazbols on Twitter are catching up from their parents' basements to the recreational practice of political extremism that Dugan has been pioneering since Lomonov. This mixture of sincerity with irony, this rejection of an unexamined life dominated by kitsch and consumerism, will found an audience in 1990s Russia, and it will find an audience in contemporary internet-addicted America. As part of, I, oh, yes, uh, here is one of the memes. This is uh, from the Eurasian Youth Movement, which I think has maybe a few hundred members, most of whom are online, but they have, they're, they're playing on all kinds of tropes, and I think this kind of shows such images. This was actually made by an award-winning Muscovite um, artist, so again, there's, a, there's an overlap between Dugan's project and his ideology and a certain type of countercultural Muscovite elite. Um, Oh, sorry, I'm about to get to that. So, no. And I, and I want, I just, I, I spoke at length about how he was a part of a, dis, a discourse, a real intellectual tradition in, in Russia. I want to also just highlight how I really think he's performing his roles as one of these roles is as the Russian philosopher, the, the beard. Now, some also say that he's a, he might be an old believer. Who, they always have beards. But he's, um, this is a very famous Russian mystical religious philosopher, Vladimir Solovyov. Um, this is a well-known painting of him. This is an image of, of Dugin from recently. Um, 
And then here, I just, I loved this. Uh, so we had his, his 90s, early 2000s persona with the what, rocket launcher. Here he is in 2022. He's described himself after the war, which he's disappointed in because it's not going fast enough. He's compared himself to Christ. He's considered himself to Cassandra. Here he is walking through a wheat field, presumably separating the wheat from the chaff. <laughs> um, kind of Tolstoyan. And I also reminiscent of other important figures from Russian intellectual tradition. We have these uh, very famous um, paintings of the Russian religious philosophers. Florensky was also a mystic, a scientist, a philosopher, um, Bulgakov next to him. Um, so I'm just, I wanted to just bring these up and then have a final quote. This is from a scholar of the um, Soviet counter, uh, post-Soviet counterculture movements. Um, so he's done a lot of work on how Eurasianism was a key part of um, artistic movements, musical movements, um, sort of like post-Soviet Samistat. Um, and as you'll see, so Fabrizio says, calls Dugan's conservative bohemia and neo-Eurasianism as a means to produce an alternative collective identity and an alternative intellectual community resisting mainstream culture and values. And in a way, the Eurasianists replicate an attempt to realize Dugan's myth about a sectarian metaphysical underground which would supposedly grant access to higher spheres of knowledge and alternative interpretations of history and reality. Many of the members of this community, and especially those who do not have an active official involvement in the political or financial side of the project, consider Dugan's political project an intellectual game in which they decided to participate. Um, abroad, of course, what he does is totally different. He can find his ways to be a warmongering extremist that embodies Western feels about Rus Russian imperialism or uh, pseudo-fascism. And when he's speaking to the Islamic world to, or, or to a more conservative crowd, he becomes an advocate of anti-liberalism, anti-Americanism, and a multipolar world that, could order, that pr would provide order for the values of family, local language, and local tradition. But what I think all of these different facades of Dugan mean is that we have, he himself is a postmodern deconstruction of these grand narratives. And I think that all of his statements, his theories, and these political performances and photographs should be read through a prism of a dark, twisted double irony, which is a reflection of what Dugan himself theorized in his idea of the fourth political theory as a Russian conservative postmodernism. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was um, fascinating. Um, in order to continue the conversation, Anton uh, Bolshevsky is going to... Bolshevsky. Anton Bolshevsky. So you haven't got an easy name like <laughs> Dugan. That's the problem. Is going to continue on talking about the geopolitical consequences of Duganism. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to, to be here. And, well... I will talk about um, other ruling uh, ideologies uh, which are present in nowadays Russia now and which are connected to Euro-Asianism. So I won't talk directly about Euro-Asianism, but I'm, somehow we'll uh, continue the thoughts of uh, Brittany here. So let's start. Uh, yes, I won't talk about Euro-Asianism, but uh, the first one which I will be talking about is Pan-Slavism. Uh, the uh, concept which was born uh, back a few hundred years ago, but which is uh, still very, uh, very much present in, in nowadays Russia and uh, present in nowadays Russia's political uh, thoughts. So, uh, well, what what what's Pan-Slavism about? Uh, it's about uh, it's a concept of uh, all Slav Slavic people should unite to form a political state based on their cultural, ethnic, linguistic, or religious uh, community. And um, well, the uh, it goes back to the 18th uh, century. Well, at least at the time when um, this uh, ideology became uh, dominant or became popular. Um, However, uh, the roots, uh, the origins going back to 15th uh, century to a Croatian uh, writer, Vinko Pribojevic, who uh, actually, if somebody checks uh, Wikipedia, it says that's uh, his Venetian uh, origin, but obviously he's, he was Croatian, but at that time, Croatian nation was not existing. Uh, or, uh, yeah. Uh, 
so uh, what uh, Pribojevic and his followers uh, uh, was uh, uh, wanted, they wanted independence, uh, uh, kind of uh, a Slavic nation state, uh, the people, all the Slavic people to live in one uh, common Slavic states and to have some kind of common language which, uh, which is the same across all the different uh, Slavic nations. So that was the, um, the idea behind, uh, behind the concept. And starting uh, from uh, 17th, 18th century, they created Slavic colors, they created Slavic hymn, uh, actually the hymn Hey Slavs, it's connected to a Slovakian um, uh, author, Samo Tomasik. Um, and well, the Slavic colors are uh, white, uh, blue, and, and red, and you can find the traces of these colors in uh, most uh, current Slavic states and some states which are not existing anymore. <clears throat> So basically, if you check the uh, ethnic map of, of Europe, you can see in, in green, it's also based on language and on ethnicity. Uh, these are the Slavic um, uh, countries or, or regions. And uh, basically, the concept be behind the pan-Slavism was to, to connect all, all of these territories together in one, uh, um, in one common uh, United State. And actually, this kind of this kind of desire um, was met uh, by ambition of the Russian Empire, which uh, um, thought itself capable of uniting all these states. And it was met by desire of Slavic population to uh, to have uh, to live in uh, separate uh, uh, in a state which is owned by Slavic people. Um, and at that time, a very attractive picture of Russia. Well, we are talking about 18th and uh, 19th century. Um, it was a very attractive picture of, of, of Russia, um, popular among uh, the people. Um, and basically, um, uh, the Slavic people, uh, uh, mostly in Central Europe or in, in the Balkans, so outside of Russia, they were um, pursuing, uh, so two types of ideas were present. One is that we should, uh, or they should create a Slavic state um, based on, on, on the state of Russia, Russian empire, so with the help of Russia. And the other thought was to, um, to create something, uh, some kind of federation within, within the Habsburg monarchy. Um, and if you look at the map of that time, it's a map of uh, 1815, you see that uh, uh, most uh, Slavic states were uh, under different rules, so either by uh, Ottoman Empire or um, uh, Habsburg Empire, and at that time, uh, Kingdom of Poland or, or Commonwealth of uh, Polish and uh, Lithuanian state was already um, uh, divided by, by Russia and uh, by other states. Um, so, um, uh, the Slavic population living in these territories, they were really, uh, they were really wanted to, uh, to have an independent state. And how did it look inside Russia? So this uh, pan-Slavic uh, movement. Uh, well, um, I can I can mention one of the authors, Andrei Samborski. He's um, uh, he, he was living in the end of 18th century, beginning of 19th century. And he, uh, his main view was that Russia has a historic mission to unite the Slavic people, and um, so it has a prominent role. Um, therefore, it's kind of, it should be like the first one among the Slavic uh, uh, nations or Slavic states. Um, and uh, the basis of this Slavic uh, common com uh, community is based on Orthodox uh, religion. Um, and he was also saying that Europe's time is up, Europe is sick, it has run out of uh, values, uh, uh, which once made it great, uh, turned away from religion, and currently it's in, in decline. So we are talking about 18th uh, century, and you can, you can see that this, this idea is still uh, um, popular uh, and still available, um, but they were already at that time. 
Uh, however, the view, uh, it was popular in 18th, 19th century, but during the Soviet time, uh, the, pan, the idea of pan-Slavism was not popular in the Soviet Union. Um, yeah, and actually some, some of the, uh, the ideas of, uh, uh, of these ideas were uh, fulfilled, like uh, in Yugoslavia, when uh, the Slavic uh, nations of, uh, uh, of the Balkan region were united, or there was a concept of uh, trimarium um, created in Poland, uh, while Hungary and Romania was also in the concept, but obviously there are no, almost no Slavic population here. Um, <clears throat> so going back to the uh, Soviet Union, it was not popular there because uh, uh, the, well, the communism and uh, the ideas of internationalism was not about uh, one dominant nation, but about different uh, ethnic, ethnic groups and different nations which uh, are united only by one ideology, by one idea, and that's uh, obviously communism. And uh, <clears throat> even uh, there was a so-called Slavist uh, case uh, in uh, 1933, uh, uh, during the era of Stalin, uh, when Stalin collected uh, all those people who were presenting this pan-Slavist movement, and most of them were actually uh, killed, and ac accusation against them was that they, they are supporting the primacy of the nation over the class, uh, they are uh, trying to preserve original culture, customs, way of life, historical traditions, um, they are trying to preserve religion, and they are promoting the superiority of Slavic race. Um, <clears throat> and actually, 10 years later, uh, during the Second World War, uh, and again, during Stalin era, uh, uh, all so-called All Slavic Committee was created, which was based, again, on pan-Slavic ideas, and uh, uh, this committee was promoting the fight of Slavic people against the, uh, the Nazi Germany and uh, against the, um, uh, the fascist ideology, um, and it was, uh, uh, this Slavic, all Slavic committee was uh, uh, working for over 20 years, uh, publishing uh, uh, magazines called Slavanie, um, and so on. Okay, I will move on because uh, my time is running out. Uh, the other one which I was to, uh, want to talk about, another concept is a uh, so-called brother, brother nations. Um, <clears throat> at first, uh, again, it, it came from uh, mostly from Russian Empire, uh, which um, promoted the idea of uh, Russian Empire as defender of Slavs. Uh, in Europe against the Ottoman uh, Empire, so some kind of uh, powerful patron which is willing to, uh, to protect uh, every Slavs uh, living, uh, living in Europe. <clears throat> uh, so it was kind of a political goal to define Slavs living in Europe as some kind of close Russian relatives. <clears throat> and again, the situation was completely different in case of uh, Ukrainians and the Russians who were living under the Russian rule. Uh, so it was different for those uh, Slavs who were living under the Russian rules and different for those who were uh, uh, living in Ottoman Empire or Habsburg uh, Empire because, well, uh, in one case it was more about political goals and in another case it was more about uh, imperialism. Um, so, in that case, in case of Ukrainians and Belarusians, uh, the Russian ideology was uh, looking uh, to them as some kind of, uh, um, uh, some kind of like, little brothers, uh, and they were called, uh, the Ukrainians were called Malarossi, uh, like small Russians. Uh, and the Ukrainian language was uh, viewed as some kind of Russian dial dialect uh, at that time. So, the brother, uh, uh, in terms, so in one case, in case of the Slavs living in the Habsburg Empire or in the Balkans, the brother was uh, uh, some kind of uh, a positive uh, attitude. So uh, those uh, relatives of Russians who are living outside of Russia, and we are willing to protect them in every possible means to uh, unite them in in one uh, empire or one Slavic state, and in. Other case, in case of those Slavs living under the Russian uh, rule, it was more of a negative way, talking about brothers, because it's, it was some kind of subordination. So they were talking about some kind of little younger brothers living under the, um, uh, the Russian 
rule. And this kind of brother concept, it, it, it changed uh, during the, uh, uh, the communist era. Okay, the other one uh, is uh, sovereign ideology, which is very much present in uh, nowadays Russia, and it's connected to Konstantin Malofeyev. And he's, uh, he's maybe every, probably most of you ho uh, heard about uh, Alexander Dugin, but I, I guess not uh, many of you heard about uh, Konstantin Malofeyev. And he is very much, uh, uh, well, not popular, but he's very much known inside uh, Russia. He's, um, he was kind of oligarch. He was into a telecommunication business in the 90s. Uh, but then he lost most of his uh, money uh, during the, the 2000s. Uh, he had some bad uh, investments. Uh, but he's still, he's not an oligarch anymore, but he's still, probably he's still very rich. And he's, he's operating um, um, a traditional um, kind of, um, um, well, very much nationalistic media. Uh, one of, of the media is called Sargrad TV. You, you can see the logo uh, uh, there. Um, and he's promoting the, the ideas that, uh, actually it's pretty much similar to the ideas promoted by Alexander Dugin. That he, uh, as, as very much as Dugin, he says that uh, uh, there is a clash of civilizations be, uh, between the West and the East, that Russia is living in a permanent uh, fight, um, and Russia is uh, um, only uh, some kind of a franchise of the West, and that Russia should, um, uh, should um, avoid this kind of uh, subordination. Um, and that the Russians should cancel everything which was uh, promoted by the West, so any kind of ideas promoted by the West. And he's promoting the idea of returning to monarchy. So he's uh, one of the most prominent um, defender of Vladimir Putin and one of the most prominent supporter of Vladimir Putin. And he, um, uh, just two quotes from, he, from him, the happiest, brightest period in the history of the Russian people was the time of the monarchy. I consider it the only saving harbor for Russia. And the other one, we believe that Putin was sent to us by God. With, with his arrival, Russia has risen from its knees and made itself respected throughout the world. And um, well, why Malofeyev is, <laughs> can be considered uh, dangerous, I, I, I can say that, because um, no, not only the ideas he's promoting, but uh, actually the, um, the money and support which he provides to organizations outside of Russia. He's very much uh, present in, uh, um, in the Balkan, for example, in Montenegro. He's organizing events in, uh, in, in uh, like Serbia. He has organizations in Serbia. He's building relationships with local nationalist groups. And um, he's promoting the idea of this kind of uh, uh, pan-Slavic concept of uh, uh, uniting, not with uh, not joining the European Union or uh, transatlantic uh, organizations, but to side with Russia. And um, he's also spending quite a lot of money. Maybe that's why he was bankrupt or broken, more or less. But he's spending a lot of money. And there, there were quite a lot of uh, journalistic uh, investigations from where uh, does he get the money, because uh, based on uh, uh, every financial reports, his uh, main businesses are massively, um, um, sorry, what's the, the uh, Vesteshegesh? Uh, Massively, like in negative. I don't know. Uh, every uh, yeah, they they are losing money every uh, every every year, but still he is, he has uh, uh, huge uh, uh, huge uh, support and huge resources. Um, and the last one, which I want to talk about, is the Ruski Mir uh, concept. Uh, well, it started more as a doctrine. Uh, presented by Vladislav Surkov. He was uh, the leader of uh, uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, presidential uh, administration um, um, between, uh, I think, 2003 and 2008. So he stepped down in 2008. Um, and the, the Ruskimir concept is very much based on the pan-Slavism uh, pan concept. And now 
is, uh, is more of an ideology that, than a doctrine. It's uh, some kind of an ideology which unites different other ideological elements uh, like Eurasianism and uh, Pan-Slavism and, and the national, uh, the sovereignty ideology which was pre presented by Malofeyev. Um, <clears throat> and well, basically the, the start was given by uh, Surkov, so he was one of the authors of, of the Ruskimir. Um, Maybe not the not the ideas, not the uh, but the organizational um, uh, structures were created by um, by Vladislav Surkov. So what 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 is the concept about? Is um, uh, Surkov said that uh, we should, uh, I mean, we like Russia uh, should uh, uh, copy everything which, uh, for example, United States is doing in terms of soft power policies. Uh, so we need to use our soft power to reach uh, the goals in um, so, uh, in cultural life, in sports, and in, in everything. Um, he said that we should promote the primacy primacy of the Russian language, uh, and we should use all the population, Russian population, which are living outside of Russia, to use in uh, in the interest of Russian. Um, uh, uh, of the Russian country, of the Russian power. Not only the Russians, the ethnic Russians, which are living outside of Russia, but the, everybody who speaks Russian language, because these people are, um, uh, are powerful resources in our hand. And, uh, well, the idea of, uh, of the Russia promoting Russian language came at the time. Uh, it's called great and mighty Russian language, Velikiya Magushi, Ruski Yazik. So kind of the primacy of the, the Russian language. So Russian language should be, uh, should be uh, the one which is uniting everything, uh, Ukrainian, Polish, uh, Serbian, everything. And uh, Vladislav Surkov uh, founded the um, uh, Ruskimir Foundation in 2007. And this is the foundation which uh, had a tremendous budget at that time, supporting, creating different organizations all over uh, Europe and all over the world. Um, <clears throat> uh, up until that, this time, I think they created 90, 94 or 97 different Ruskimir centers across, across the, the globe. Um, well, in, here in, in Budapest, we also have a, a Ruskimir uh, foundation based on a Russian cultural center operating here. Um, and they, are, they were supporting uh, uh, the local organizations to, uh, I don't know, to uh, at first, it was pretty pretty normal, uh, like uh, create I don't know uh, evenings to speak about poems and books, um, promote um, uh, uh, Russian uh, dramas, Russian films, and then they started to organize political uh, events like demonstrations. Um, so it, it's and it started to shift in in a, in a political uh, political uh, direction. Um, so basically, the, the main idea of the concept, concept is to use Russian minorities uh, outside, of, outside of Russia. And as you can see, uh, in a post-Soviet space, there are quite, quite a lot of uh, Russian minorities living. Uh, so, uh, for example, in the Baltic states, it's like one-fourth of the population uh, are Russian. Or um, in Kazakhstan, it's also like one-fourth of the population. Um, but if we uh, uh, if we talk about those who are speaking Russian, it's it's much much more. <laughs> so uh, uh, you can see in Eastern Ukraine um, it can reach up to seventy percent. Uh, but again, we're not talking about ethnic Russians. These are those who are uh, speaking Russian as their mother tongue. Mm, so the concept was to. Uh, Based on the, why, why don't we use all these people who are uh, who have ties to Russia in a way or another, and to use them uh, in in Russian political um, uh, political goals? And at that time, Russia started to provide passports to everybody who can prove any kind of connection to Russia. So they were providing millions of passports in Moldova, in Ukraine, in, in the Baltic states. Um, before, uh, it was not possible to, well, I mean, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, it was pretty hard to, to get a Soviet, uh, uh, not Soviet, sorry, uh, Russian uh, citizenship. Uh, but uh, starting from 2000s, uh, it, it became pretty easy. And the creation of Russian media was also um, um, created at that time, 2005, the creation of Russia Today, <clears throat> which uh, started to operate in... Um, in the first years, I think in 14 different countries in uh, many, many languages. And at first, actually, uh, Russia Today was, was pretty, 
pretty well organized uh, uh, media. It was based on the ideas of uh, Al Jazeera, which was operated by Qatar, uh, based on uh, journalistic standards. Uh, and then uh, gradually from 2013, 14, it shifted into the, uh, into the way of, uh, of different uh, uh, conspiracy theories and uh, anti-Western um, ideology and, and so on. But it, it, it goes back to, to this period in the beginning of 2000s and uh, to the concept of Rus Kimir. And yeah, I think uh, I think I will stop. I will stop here because yeah, I spoke too much already. Thank you very much. Well, that was uh, fascinating. So we covered a lot of territory, I think, um, and and all of it um, from what some might call an illiberal perspective. Um, so I was wondering what, what one of the things that seemed to strike me from both your talks is um, the, these ideologies, these, these views are all uh, reactive. They seem to be full of ressentiment that um, something went wrong and were the victims of some oppressive uh, circumstance, primarily liberal capitalism. And um, the, the ideologies themselves seem to be rather, well, in Dugin's case, as Brittany pointed out, um, using a lot of postmodern thinking that seems to just put an ideology together for some specific purpose, what the French used to call bricolage, you know, and it's um, so that although it looks substantial, none of these ideologies really hang together very much except through the idea that they've got a lot of anger and oppression that fills a certain void. I wonder what both of you thought. Can you hear me? It's on already. Um, no, I mean, absolutely. And I, th I think um, Dugan's resentment, I mean, and I mean, and Lomonov had the same, and they were, they were so angry at how weak the Russian state was in the 1990s. It was just this, and, and they're still making up for it. It's just this sort of petulance that, that they weren't global actors during the Yugoslav war, that they weren't global. And so I think that that's absolutely right. I'll, I'll say the one, the one difference is I think, I mean, he, and he's not as significant, I think Gumolov was really building something. I mean, he was really, I, I should have mentioned, when I had the picture of him, he's, there are statues of him all over Central Asia um, and monuments that was, he really, I think he, he really thought they were gonna build economic ties, cultural ties. Um, but he was, of course, not reactionary. He was living in, this, in the sweet middle spot <laughs> of the Soviet project. Um, but yeah, I think this, this anger is, is almost palpable in, in, in Dugan for the past 30 years. Well, I think it's, it's based on the, how the, um, the Cold War ended. It ended with, a, well, with the loss of Russia, right? And um, at the beginning, yes, it was more, more, more about anger. And then it was about how do we uh, describe, uh, how, how do we reason? What, uh, I mean, in, in case of Russia, uh, why did it happen? Why, why did Russia lose? And then uh, they started to uh, to create uh, all these theories that, well, uh, because of uh, uh, soft power of United States, because of uh, uh, liber liberal lefts uh, uh, influence and, and so on. And then they started to shift towards uh, different conspiracy theories. Uh, there is the so-called uh, Dulles plan. I don't know if you uh, in Russia is a pretty pretty popular theory how. Uh, how uh, United States? Uh, well, it, it's not existing. It's a it's a um, the so-called Dulles plan. Uh, actually, Russian leaders talking about the so-called Dulles plan, and uh, they connect it to a, a CIA um, director. I don't remember his um, his first name, but his second name was was Dulles. Uh, 
something, and that he created a secret plan how should they, uh, how the Soviet Union should be collapsed, and with promotion of um, American films, uh, slowly going into the Russian mines, and then uh, with drugs uh, entering Russia Soviet market, uh, and so this kind of plan never existed, and uh, actually the first time this kind of dualist plan uh, appeared was in a, in a fictional book created by a Russian author um, beginning of 90s. And then uh, somehow it uh, uh, went into the mainstream and, and uh, it's kind of now in Russia they're talking about it as, uh, as, uh, as something which is, uh, uh, is a real thing, which is not. So uh, different conspiracy theories were, were created just to justify why did Russia lose, that uh, there were reasons behind it and, and now uh, Russia should uh, attack back and um, and get what 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 Russia deserves. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, so we can take a few questions, uh, Philip. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for both of your um, uh, talks. I I would like to ask Dr. Pfeiffer Noble a question. Um, well, first of all, thank you for bringing up not just Alexander Dugin, but Eduard Limonov, because there are so many similarities between those two characters. And uh, I would say that both Alexander Dugin and Eduard Limonov have shared almost well, somewhat equal level of uh, uh, influence in modern Russia, especially among the, the youth. Um, and in many ways, Eduard Limonov was maybe even more uh, influential than Dugin. So they, 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 they claim to represent different um, sides of the political spectrum, and yet they agreed on so many essential things, uh, including the, uh, um, the relations of, of Russia with post-Soviet states, uh, and that, of course, includes Ukraine. So why do you think that um, the West has chosen Alexander Dugin as this figure that, who allegedly influenced Putin? Why, why Dugin and not Limonov? Was it because Putin at some point uh, quoted Gumilov's uh, uh, teaching of personalness, or is it really the beard? I, I Thank you. No, um, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I, I think though, but but the oh, thing yeah, that um, Limonov also had already, I mean, he came back to Russia after the Soviet Union fell, so he had already branded himself as this guy who'd like live in New York City and slept on the streets and had like a Parisian avant-garde life. So I think he, he just didn't, his, his project was always so anti-establishment and his violence was always so teenage that it didn't, um, I just, I think to a, to a Western onlooker, he doesn't, he doesn't work as well. His brand doesn't work as well. Um, and the idea, I mean, well, I, I was obviously, you know, my, my thesis is that Dugan is also not influencing Putin, but it's a great branding. But I think that the, the chaos um, of, of Limonov, the, the, the autobiographies, he just seems like a man with no boundaries. And I think we in the West think of Putin as a man of control. And Dugan also looks like a man of control. So if I may add, yeah. uh, um, uh, well, I think it's also because that uh, Limonov, uh, sorry, Dugin was never opposing uh, Russian president and the Russian power. In the very beginning. Uh, though, yeah, but not in the 2000s. Yeah. And uh, Limonov had all these uh, yeah. uh, movements and action in 2004, 2005, when his movement started to like, capture the buildings. And, and like, set off smoke. Uh, yeah, the gases, political yeah. actions, yeah. and he was he was also uh, imprisoned for I don't know for uh, maybe not years, but like for a few weeks or yeah. months, and he was like anti-governmental figure, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, Dugin was not. He was he was always like pro pro Putin, so in the two thousands. Yeah, mean, by the mid two thousands, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I wanted to ask um, Anton, what do you think is the prospect now for for the Russians to use soft power uh, in the wake of, of the war, where, where they seem to have, uh, whatever you think about the invasion, they seem to have completely destroyed the reputation of Russia in the West. Or, or will they be looking to use soft power elsewhere in the world, which doesn't seem to have had the same negative reaction to the Ukraine invasion that uh, the EU and the North American uh, countries have had? Well, I just had an article in Hungarian, though, uh, this week about the Russian soft power, how, how did it collapse uh, uh, after, the, after the war? Because all the achievements which Putin uh, uh, 
reached uh, during his uh, his presidency. Well, if Putin um, stops his being a president in 2008 and um, goes away, he will he would become um, like a famous uh, Russian president who's yeah. uh, mm -hmm. who's uh, present in historical books. But uh, he didn't. And everything which uh, which happened during the the 2000s, uh, if you remember at the time, it was really uh, a huge uh, a huge influence of Russian culture started. Like uh, Russian musical bands appeared, like Tattoo, uh, Dimo Bilan, uh, Leningrad Group, and they were they were famous not not only in Russia but outside of Russia. Suddenly, Russian um, uh, sport. Uh, Sportsmen appeared like uh, Anna Kurnikova, Maria Sharapova, mm -hmm. um, um, Russian footballers, uh, Arshavin. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, so, so Russia uh, suddenly became quite um, uh, not famous, but quite visible on international sphere uh, during the 2000s. Um, Russia was included in G7, so it was created G8. Uh, different organizations were created uh, within Russia which supported this kind of um, uh, uh, relations building like uh, St. Petersburg's Economic Forum. Um, and, and now what if, you, if we look into this kind of soft power sphere uh, now, um, well, Russian sportsmen are, are not really visible because they, are ca they cannot attend uh, uh, to uh, international uh, sports. Um, well, all Russian uh, authors are, are not all, but the most famous ones are banned from Russia. They are uh, like Ulitskaya, she is now uh, inaugurant, um, uh, uh, like uh, Gluchowski, who is the author of The Metro 2033, one of the most famous Russian Sifi book in the last uh, 30 years. So they, they all uh, uh, said as to be uh, uh, foreign agents in Russia. They, 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 they don't get any support. They mig migrated Russia. Uh, the most famous Russian bands, they are not present in Russia. They migrated, like the Little Big, uh, um, Manija, Monetochka. Uh, anyway, uh, so I think at that point, Russian soft power has ended. I don't see any any uh, because still this world is dominated by uh, Western influence. If you if you are in a bad relationship with the West, you you cannot participate in sports. Uh, uh, foreign I don't know producers won't won't fund your films, won't uh, support your books, won't uh, promote your uh, music in international arena. So at this point, I think Russian soft power has has ended for uh, for several years at least uh, until, up until the time when they they're able to rebuild everything but I, I don't think that uh, uh, nowadays Russia want to rebuild all these ties they uh, clearly uh, soft power was the main goal during the 2000s and then they shifted more to an economic influence uh, through energy through uh, trade relations uh, and now they reach the point when the influence is done through uh, hard power through military and so, so are not, they are not relying to, to soft power anymore. I think it's, uh, this is a concept which, which is not present anymore in, in Russian establishment. I don't think we do reject uh, Russian culture because all the, the authors which I mentioned, like Luhovsky or Olitskaya, they were uh, supported uh, in Europe. So they, uh, they find, uh, found a place in uh, European universities. They, they got some, I don't know, scholarships so to, to still uh, be able to survive somehow. And at the time of the Soviet era, uh, mostly you hear about uh, the, the Soviet culture which was supported by the West is the culture which was anti-Soviet. Uh, anti Mm -hmm. uh, those who emigrated uh, Russia, but not those who... Uh, I, I, personally, I can't mention any names of pro-Soviet, I don't know, writers or, uh, or musicians who were popular in the Soviet Union at that time, but basically their names did not survive because the, uh, um, the products which they created were not uh, good enough. But uh, uh, those writers who were against uh, the, the communism rule, like, rule like Dovlatov, Solzhenitsyn, uh, you, you know them because uh, uh, they migrated or they standed against the rule and created the pieces of work which um, 
which survived uh, during these decades. And I, and I don't think that nowadays in, in Europe, I, I do agree that um, sometimes there are cases where they are banning like Russian classical pieces, which, which is not good, obviously. Uh, but I hope that's only, um, um, only something which will, uh, which will pass and uh, nobody will ban uh, Chekhov or, uh, I don't know, Tchaikovsky in, in the future because of, of, of course it's, it's nonsense. But uh, if we are talking, talking about nowadays Russian culture, um, mostly those who are famous or who, who presented something, they are uh, among those people who are against the Russian, uh, the Russian uh, government and who, who left the country. Well, uh, maybe a final question. Um, There's a gentleman yeah. here. Um, in the Soviet times, uh, there were very strong ideas related to international security, uh, like collective security, uh, peaceful cooperation with, with the West, and the Soviet leaders considered the UN a very important institution due to the fact that the Soviet Union was or is a permanent member of the Security Council. In the 1980s, especially in the second half, uh, defense and security intellectuals on the Soviet side and the American side cooperated very strongly and, and understood each other, especially regarding nuclear deterrence. Where are those intellectuals? Can you hear those voices of, of those people or they are in prison or disappeared or what happened to them? Thank you. Do you want, uh, I, I mean, I th this is, I'll just give a, a short, guess because I'm a little bit younger probably than the people we want to be making these decisions. But I think there's a very different culture of of how US State Department people are being educated and it's um, maybe not as collaborative as it was and there's not the sort of fresh excitement um, of working with the post-Soviet space the way that there was. That's my short. We, we don't really know. <laughs> um, That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, maybe one last question from the gentleman up there. Maybe I can have uh, two questions or two remarks. That uh, first is that the software in uh, Russia is di uh, diminishing in the West, in the Western Hemisphere. But if you look to the third world, in the global South, in the Arabic world, uh, it becomes stronger and stronger. Uh, both militarily and uh, both the soft power. So. Uh, uh, we shouldn't uh, say that uh, we are the world. Uh, so uh, if, you, if we see the globe, uh, it's a different uh, perspective. And the uh, second that uh, maybe it was mentioned that uh, 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 in Russia, uh, uh, the origin of the ideologies are usually Western ideologies. So uh, for example, the Pan-Slavism originally is not a Russian ideology. It was born in the, in uh, Croatia, Hungary, Czechia, so they, in small Slavic countries, and uh, they if they found it. So um, uh, if you see the history, Russia always wanted to buy, wanted to be uh, to reach the West, wanted to be part of the West, and uh, was uh, uh, hurted by rejection of the West. Okay. Well. Thank you. Uh, two questions there. One about Russian um, feelings that they've been hurt by the West, I think, and that's why they're fighting war, presumably. Do you want to start, or? Oh, well, um, yeah, regarding um, those outside of West uh, supporting Russia, well, I, I don't see it like, like that. Well, obviously, Russia is doing everything in order to establish uh, more relations to third countries because now the, every, every trade relations, economic relations, political relations with the West were, were, were cut. So they are trying, Lavrov is uh, traveling to Africa, trying to, to reach out to African people, to, I don't know, Indonesian uh, people. But so far, maybe it will bring some results, but so far we can talk about results. Russian trade towards this country is still minor. It's very, very minimal. You can't you can't find any uh, uh, any traces of uh, uh, 
suddenly improving trade relationship towards these countries. And um, uh, the third countries are representing um, around, uh, well, if we don't count uh, uh, like India, China, um, well, the, the Western bloc is presenting 60% of the world's uh, GDP together. So, of course, Russia can, and, and Russia's is 1.5. So, of course, Russia can try to walk around and, and find, uh, establish better relationship with Somalia or uh, Eritrea or uh, Syria, but it won't help Russia uh, in economical terms. But, uh, they, but if they've got China and India, they don't have to. <laughs> that's true, worry. that's true, but we, we still don't see uh, this kind of improvement. Oh, obviously, these countries are interested. Uh, uh, because in, if you are uh, in the position of a small, I don't know, African country, of course you want to attract uh, Western investments, you want to attract uh, Russian investors, you want to buy cheap Russian oil, why not? If, if uh, Russia is providing me, if Russia is willing to, I don't know, support me with uh, technologies or whatever, of course uh, they, they, they will uh, pop in. But what these countries can provide to Russia, that's the question. Of course, Russia can sell to them their military uh, equipment, they can sell to them maybe energy, uh, but uh, uh, it's not an equal relationship. I mean, and the, and the same with China. In, in a ch from China's perspective, it's not an equal relationship towards Russia because Russia will always uh, be able to sell only energy or other resources, and uh, um, uh, they are not creating, uh, I don't know, high tech or or, or other uh, stuff which is bought from uh, was bought from from the West. So I think. Uh, Yes, we can we can talk about interest, but it's uh, it's not like uh, I mean Russia is substituting the West for I don't know Africa or mm -hmm. uh, or Eastern Asia because it's it's not possible. And China is in a very uh, difficult position in this regard because China's trade with Russia is minimal. It's mostly about energy resources, and probably they will buy more energy because it's cheaper now. It's like forty one percent cheaper on the market, Russian uh, oil because of of its toxicity, um, um, it's, it's much cheaper. Uh, but uh, Russian, tr uh, Chinese trade is going towards Europe and towards uh, United States. So they won't risk uh, losing all these trade volumes uh, to like substitute, I don't know, open more business in, in Russia. They will try to do so, but not like uh, openly or uh, not in a big um, uh, quantities because uh, for them they they cannot risk losing the the Western business. I I believe so. Uh, that's why the biggest uh, Chinese companies officially they are not not operating like Huawei, Xiaomi. They're not operating in Russia. Um, uh, another question was uh, the Western uh, uh, ideologies. Why it's? Yeah, I I think that I mean I've. I think that this, the anxiety of, of Russia not being a part of Europe is not, a, a, I think it was a really important theme for Rus Russian elites in the 18th and 19th century, but I think in the 20th century, um, between the Soviet project, between the huge influx of, of Russian thinkers and writers in Europe, between the early 2000s, uh, detente with with Russia in the West. I think that I think that I mean I don't want I can't speak for all Russia, but I think that that the they are still a part of that they see themselves as a part of Europe. Yeah, maybe Eastern Europe, maybe uh, maybe different than the West. But I think that this sort of um, despite having talked about Eurasian, this sort of anxiety of are we Europeans? I think is not a, a central feature of the debate about what Russian identity is today. I would venture. Well. Thank you for um, that. I think it's getting pretty cold in here and it's a cold war outside. So we could call it a day and ask, uh, well, thank our two excellent speakers for their uh, accounts of current um, Eurasian thinking, really. So thank you very much. And thank you very much.